People like you, you're preaching to the choir. That's why you're here. Uh, you, you probably believe along my lines. Uh, that's why you're here. And that gets a little frustrating because you really would like to convince other people. Like today, polls state that 75 to 80 percent of the public does not believe the Warren Commission. Well, it's our job then to convince that final 20 percent, I guess, how wrong they are. And that's difficult because I think as a country we're in denial. I think that we believe that things can't happen here that do. What took place November the 22nd, 1963, ladies and gentlemen, was a coup d'etat. That's an overthrow of our government. It was not done at the ballot box. It was done to a bullet, but done by a bullet in the head. And we got a new government that day. And uh, <clears throat> that's that to me. We have to come to grips with that. That yes, indeed, it happened in the United States of America. It didn't happen in some <clears throat> far off land. It didn't happen. It happened right here and it changes forever. It hurts me to the soul to think what our country would be like today had John Kennedy lived. Had John Kennedy lived, there would have been no Vietnam War. Had John Kennedy lived, the Cold War would have ended in 1965. There's a tremendous book out there called JFK and the Unspeakable. The author's name is Douglas. He, he's actually a Catholic theologian, and he discovered this stuff in the Vatican that right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you know who's a hero to me today too? Nikita Khrushchev. Because he backed down twice, not once, twice, from a nuclear confrontation or war with us. And I learned through, through the unspeakable book that Khrushchev and Kennedy were back channel communicating with each other and their governments didn't even know it. And the two of them had agreed to end the Cold War by 65. Imagine what our world would be today had the Cold War ended in 65. Imagine that for a moment. And then I'll, I'll get done with that by saying, I'm sick and tired of war. We've, I've been, I was born 1951, post-World War II, and if you count the war on drugs, and that's a war also, talk to the Mexican people, how many they lose every year in that war. Uh, we've been at war my entire life, literally. And I've had enough. Enough of war. We wouldn't even be debating health care right now if they wouldn't have gone to Iraq and Afghanistan because we'd have more money than we'd ever know what to do for health care. Could be fixing our infrastructure and doing all that stuff. Instead of, in my view of the Middle East, let's get the hell out of there. And I don't think I'm alone because let's go back to the Anglo-Saxon America. Isn't it ironic that in America our history begins at 1492? Nothing ever happened here before that, I guess. Our kids have never taught about anything before 1492. That's the day America began, you know? This, this whole continent appeared magically. Now, but let's go back and look at, and I'm not gonna debate the good or bad of Christopher Columbus, you know? But think of this for a moment. What was Columbus trying to do when he came here? He was looking for another way to India, right? So way back then, why? They didn't want to go through the Middle East. <laughs> Do we need anything more? I mean, this guy at science then said you'd fall off the earth. It was flat. He was willing to risk that to stay out of the Middle East. I rest my case. How many hundreds of years? Let's get the hell. And then for all the people that love Ronald Reagan, the icon of the Republican Party, right? What happened when the, when the terrorists hit the Marine barracks in Lebanon? Reagan, to quote the Republicans, Bill O'Reilly and all them, cut and ran. Good. He said, let's get the hell out of here. He didn't go to war when 200 and some of our Marines were killed over there with that car bomb. He got the hell out of there. It's time to get out of there. Let them to themselves. Just like this whole Syria deal. <laughs> If you buy into chemical weapons, I got some swamp land in Florida for you. <laughs> the real reason, the oil companies want to put a pipeline through Syria and Assad's not cooperating, so they need to overthrow that government, get a cooperative government in there so they can run the pipeline. That's what it's about. Oil for money. It's that simple. That's what they want. That's why this is all going on. But you gave me hope because 
people responded. It was 300 to 1 calls to a congressman and senator saying no to this war. Maybe we're finally starting to wake up. Enough war. Enough. You know, let's get out of there. If I become president, we're gone. said than done. And uh, I'm not young anymore. I actually qualified for Social Security this year. Believe it or not, Jesse, the body's now 62. <laughs> and uh, my reason of reluctance is this. You ever see how fast they all age? <laughs> I mean, Bill Clinton went in with beautiful dark hair, and by the time he got out, it's as white as snow. Barack Obama's hair is already turning white. Well, I don't have to worry about that. My job is gone. But, I mean, you're still going to age. You, I, I would predict you age four years for every one year in there. So, you know, I, and, and plus, my wife of 38 years, she don't like it. She don't want me doing it. But yeah. Chauncey, you got the body of three twenty-year-olds. There's no that, better man. Not quite that. I had to replace my hip. You know, twenty-year-olds don't go through that. But uh, stop yelling now. And then just keep this under under control. But uh, quickly, why did I write this book? I wrote this book because I've been studying the, the Kennedy assassination diligently since about 1985, when pro wrestling changed. Uh, prior to that, it was all territories and you drove. You lived in an area and you drove to the different towns in that particular area. There were 26 of them. Vince McMahon in the mid-80s changed wrestling with cable television and he made us a national sport where we switched from driving to flying in airplanes. Anybody knows that if you do a job where you fly in airplanes every day, you get a lot of dead time. You sit in airports and you sit on planes. So I began educating myself. I said, make something good out of this. So I started reading. And I read every book I could get my hands on about the Kennedy assassination. And I wrote this book because for what it's worth, for what it's worth 100 years from now, I want the world to know that the 38th governor of Minnesota did not believe the Warren Commission and did not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole assassin if he was an assassin at all. And you know, Lee Harvey Oswald still has his children, his girls are adults now. They probably live under a city name. And I think it's high time that their father be cleared of what he was blamed for. Because in my opinion, Lee Harvey Oswald did not shoot President John F. Kennedy. Uh, I lead the book off with what's called the Katzenbach Memo. And I don't think you've ever seen this before. Uh, maybe some of you have, I don't know. But let me go to it for a moment, and I won't take much of it, but this was a memo from Nicholas, the then Acting Attorney General Nick, Nicholas Katzenbach, to the new President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, on Monday morning. Now, JFK got killed on Friday, and Oswald got killed on Sunday. This was Monday morning. Listen to this. Now, this isn't me, a conspiracy theorist. This is a U.S. government document, a memo. One, the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin. That right there said, we're not going to investigate. We've already named him the assassin. Okay? Then he did not have any Confederates who are still at large. In other words, he did it alone and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. They haven't even looked at a speck of evidence yet. And I'll give you a personal note. When my mother passed away, she had, she kept one of those big trunks and my son was about 14 and we were going through it. And for whatever reason, she kept every Minneapolis newspaper that weekend. And in the Minneapolis paper, now remember this is pre-computers, 1963. The Minneapolis paper that Monday morning, so it had to have gone out late afternoon, Sunday, at the latest, sub-headline down on the front page, 
Dallas police declare case closed. My son looked at me at age 14 and he said, gee, Dad, they spend more time on a domestic. <laughs> and I think my son said it all right there in that simple word. So he had to be convicted at trial. Then if you go to the back of the memo, it said, I think, however, that a statement that all the facts will be made public properly and in an orderly and responsible way should be made now. We need something to head off public speculation or congressional hearings of the wrong sort. Well, the wrong sort means investigate the crime and find out who might have did it. That's the Katzenbach memo. That's why I lead it off. It's not even one of the 63. But I, feel I, was so, I wanted that there. Now I'll finish and then we'll take questions because that way I can answer what you want to talk about. You'll have plenty to read in this book. It's a great read. But I want you to read where I start editorializing a little in the last chapter and listen to this. This came from PBS's Charlie Rose. There's absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. Evidence now. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, boy, <laughs> third in median household income, fourth in labor force, and fourth in exports. We lead the world today in only three categories, and wait till you hear what they are. We lead the world in the number of incarcerated citizens per capita, in other words, people in jail, yet home of the brave, land of the what? Free. Well, that's obviously not true, and here's the one I love. We lead the world in the number of adults who believe angels are real. <laughs> yeah. And finally, we lead the world in defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are our allies. So why are we spending this money on defense like the when 25, shut those damn phones off. I want you to think of this as a green on a golf course. Cell phones banned, shut them off. I've never owned one, nor will I ever. I'll put it on my grave now, it's a life thing. I want to put, he never owned a cell phone. And I'll bet when I do that, I'll be the only one on the planet. Oh, you'll get one. Oh yeah, you will. Something will make you. Anyway, uh, but uh, that, those aren't good statistics, people. I'm tired of war. I'm tired of the, I live in Mexico now half the year, and I'll end with this and then open for questions. Do you know what the most, a few years ago, you know what the most popular t-shirt I saw with young people wearing in Mexico? Che Guevara? No. I only wish Che Guevara. Made in USA. It, no, it was a picture of George Bush and it said, weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> now, is that what we want the rest of the world to view the United States as? A weapon of mass destruction? Is it, do we want the United States to be viewed as they're, they're afraid of us? They're terrified of us? Because if they don't go along with us, we might invade and wage war on them? I hope not because that isn't the vision I have or I've ever had for this country. So on that note, uh, I'll open up for any questions you may have and uh, feel free, but uh, please speak loud enough so that everyone in the room can hear because not everyone has the benefit of a microphone. Yes, young man. Uh, I'm 32. 9-11 is kind of my JFK assassination. Sure. Do you see Osama bin Laden as the modern day Lee Harvey Oswald? Yep. That's simple, yes, I do. Uh, here, 9 11, what did they tell us? Here's the, here's the official. And always remember when they come out with an official story, it's generally to protect officials. That's why it's named that. Uh, the, the official story on 9 11 is this that 19 Islamic radicals armed with box cutters defeated our multi billion dollar air defense system 
all while conspiring with a bearded guy in a cave in Afghanistan on a dialysis machine. And we bought that. We accepted that because our government told us that's what happened. Now, I have one question. Where'd they come up with the box cutters when everyone was dead? How was that determined? Did that just fly out in some story and became the, you know, because if you repeat something enough, it becomes the truth, at least within the media it does. So, yes, you're 9-11, and I believe Osama bin Laden is your Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, he, he's that guy that terrified us throughout the world, and then they allegedly killed him. I can't figure out how it took so long. Traipsing through the mountains of Afghanistan with a dialysis machine, and we couldn't load, and the guy was six foot six. <laughs> you know, I mean, I haven't met too many people from the Middle East that carry that type of height. You know, I would think he's head and shoulders above everybody else in the crowd over there. How could they miss him for that many years? Yes, sir. Yes, Governor. A uh, question on this is you hear a lot of uh, talk about whether Oswald was uh, a sharpshooter, whether he was accurate, where he earned his marksmanship in the Marines or not. You being a SEAL, I, <coughs> let's settle this. Was he a marksman? Was he able, if, was he that good of a shot to be able to do this if indeed he was a lone shooter? No. And I'll I tell mean, you, no, and I, no, 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 and it has nothing to do with what I tried to repeat it. I couldn't do it. And I'm expert in both, and I qualified at 50 at Camp Ripley with an M16 still when I was governor. Uh, but let me say why, no. When you go into the military, they give you batteries of tests and all this. They check you up because the military's not dumb. They want to find out what you're best at so they can channel you to where you can best help the military. If Oswald was a good shot, he would have been 0300 infantry. He was a radar technician. He probably never carried a weapon his entire time in the Marine Corps. He, and now, don't get me wrong, we need radar technicians. We need pencil pushers. Not everybody can be a knuckle dragger, as we refer to them. But, you know, and he was serving his country. He also was, the, the, the military sent him to Russian language school. Now, they don't do that with infantry men. They do that with people that work for the Office of Naval Intelligence. That's where you go to school so that you can work like that. But Oswald never, he was a radar technician. He, and don't believe my shooting. Go to my book and see Carlos Hathcock, the greatest Marine Corps sniper in history, the head instructor at the Quantico Marine Sniper School, <coughs> attempted it 10 times with that weapon and Carlos couldn't do it. This is the greatest sniper in Marine Corps history. And he can't do the shooting, but Lee Oswald could? Come Thank on. You. Thank you. you what, did that answer it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Way in the back. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you feel, or how's your feeling about any personnel involved with Kennedy assassination carried forth of 9-11? Uh, is there anybody who uh, was part of both? Both? No, I don't think so, because most are dead. You know, you're talking it's 50 years this year, so if you were 20 at the time of Kennedy, today you're 70. I was in seventh grade. Yeah, I was, I was born in 1951. I was in seventh grade when it happened. I remember they sent us home from school immediately. And probably that was the first time in my life I saw junior high kids go home directly <laughs> from school. That's how serious it was. And then, of course, Sunday we were glorified with the first live murder on television. Here's one you'll get in the book that they, they held, withheld from you. Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby knew each other since Lee was a kid. Doesn't that change the whole thing? The fact that the Warren Commission said there was no connection between the two. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that. Yes, sir. Oh, you're a reporter. Wait a minute. You go. Yes, you're a doctor. Here. Hi, Governor. Um, I had a question. If you decided to run in 2016, what would you do about all the, you touched on it earlier, the oil lobbies and our oil dependency? Well, I can tell you this, and I believe I'm the only elected official I've met in 50 years, if we go back to Jack Kennedy or more, can make this statement to you. When I ran for governor of Minnesota, I made more money doing the job than what I spent to get it. I only raised $300,000.
That's all I raised in $50 donations from people like you. I did not spend, I did not accept $1 of PAC money. I didn't accept any special interest money and get this for four years. I never once met with a lobbyist. So I was never bribed. Why do you think they wanted me gone? The lobbyists were out of business. They were going to the unemployment line. <laughs> said, and why did I need to meet with them? They didn't elect me. I told my staff the first day, no lobbyists. Right. Tell them no. Yeah, I got nothing to talk to them about. That, that's a, that seems incredible to me. And today well, that's why they don't talk about my election. The Democrats and Republicans, this was 98, combined spent 12 million. And I beat them. See, all, I have a simple premise, people. If I can debate them, I can beat them. I got to get in the debates because that's the key. I went from polling 10% at the primary to winning seven weeks later because I was allowed in the debates. But guess who decides that? The Democrats and Republicans who decide whether you get in or out. And uh, why are they allowed to do that? It's been since 1992, Ross Perot, since you've heard a third voice in a debate. 1992. That's over 20 years you have not heard any other voice in a debate. So, I, you know, to win the presidency, you got to get in the debates. And then I will warn you of this. If I were elected, be prepared because they're going to punish you. They will punish you because they put their parties first, they put their money people second, and we the people might be third. Look at what you got today. They're putting their parties first. They're putting their money people second, and we, have, and we have a government shutdown. All the other countries third. We never see any of it. They give all our Well, money. another thing you'd get from Jesse Ventura, foreign aid would end. <laughs> I, put it, I put it this simple. I mean to the world, because I make it this simplistic. We're broke. We're so far in debt. Let's put it on a personal level. Your house is being repossessed. You're four, you're four months behind in your car payment, but Uncle Bob on the other side of town wants to borrow 500 bucks from you. You capable of giving it to him? No. We're so far in debt today, how on earth can we possibly give money to anyone else? So foreign aid would end under me. I mean, if United States aid comes first. Then we'll worry about the rest of the world later when we're done taking care of our country first like we ought to be. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Jesse, um, Jack Ruby grew up in Chicago. We, Harvey Oswald, grew up in the Bronx. I don't understand how you could say you knew each other uh, when he was kid. Because Jack Ruby, because Lee Harvey Oswald didn't stay in New York very long. They knew each other in New Orleans when Lee Harvey Oswald's uncle, Dutz Morant, worked for Carlos Marcello of the Mafia because Jack Ruby used to come down there for many years to get girls to dance in his club. And Judith Vary Baker, who's today in hiding in Sweden for fear of her life, was Oswald's mistress in New Orleans, and she went to dinner with Jack Ruby and Lee Oswald on multiple occasions. She knew him as Sparky Rubenstein his name before he shortened it to Jack Ruby. Well, when I say a kid, that doesn't mean this time kid. It means under 18. He knew him, you know, because you're under 18, you're still a kid, you know. I remember when I went in the military. I did my first tour to Southeast Asia, right? Nine-month tour, went through SEAL, UDT SEAL training, boot camp, all that deployed. Did a nine-month tour to Southeast Asia, came back, and guess what? I couldn't drink or vote. We didn't get the 18 vote till 1972. Couldn't drink or vote, so I think I got a pretty good lawsuit for child abuse. Because <laughs> isn't sending children to war, wouldn't you classify that child abuse? I wasn't an adult. I had been back for one week and I went into my ex I said, I want to go back overseas now. He said, what are you talking about? You just got back. I, why? You got to spend at least a year here before you rotate back. I said, because over there I'm an adult, here I'm a child. I can't even go up on Orange Avenue in Coronado and have a beer. And yet I'd been overseas drinking all the beer I wanted. But back in my own home country, I was still a child. Double standard, huh? Pretty good one, too. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
And if you've asked a question, please don't ask two because there's a lot of people that, and I can't remember who's all done it. Go ahead. Now that you're putting all this information out to the public, are you afraid for your life? Am I afraid for my life? I don't know. You think I should be? I don't know. But I'm not going to live in fear. And I'm a sucker for the truth. And I'm tired of my country lying to me. Don't you love that? When we lie to the government, we go to jail. Because Martha Stewart, that's what she went for. It wasn't insider trading. They dropped that. They got her for lying to Congress. You go to jail. Yet when they lie to us, let's see, we go to war. <laughs> Seems to me we're getting the shit end of the stick twice. <laughs> they lied about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They lied about Iraq being tied to Al Qaeda. They lied about the rescue of Jessica Lynch. And they lied about the murder of Pat Tillman, the, the pro football player who's a true hero. He could have signed for millions, but he went off to war on the lies. And he got killed. Now, I understand you can die from friendly fire in that business. It can happen. But why did they burn his diary after? I think Pat Tillman was going to come home and tell us all it was all bullshit over there, and they didn't want that. They wanted this hero, and they and their message was more important than Pat's life. You know? Yes, sir. Was there a pristine bullet found on a stretcher? Yes. And what was Tippett? What was he all about? Well, Officer Tippett was a police officer that was shot in the street about a half hour after the president was shot. What was, was his shot. role, in your opinion? Tippett's and, role? And was there a, a, a third bullet which was pristine? Well, the, there was the pristine bullet they found, and the way to debunk that is simple. That pristine bullet, I think it's Warren Commission Exhibit 299 or 399, one of them two. The way you can debunk that is simple. That bullet is so pristine, Governor Conley had more shrapnel in his body than that bullet would weigh brand new if you added it to it. So that clearly shows bullets can't get bigger than they are brand new. The other thing, uh, Harold Weisberg, he's dead now, fantastic. He, this guy did more research than anybody with what he knew. The actual Kennedy x-rays of his head showed particles of lead scattered all throughout his head, which means he got hit by a flangible bullet, an exploding bullet, right? Well, the Manlicher Carcano is a Geneva Convention military weapon. It can only shoot a full metal jacket bullet. It can't shoot one that breaks apart. So that shows you right there that that rifle was not the rifle that caused the headshot. And that's their own evidence. And there's 62 more pieces of evidence in here that are just as dynamic as that. Yes, sir. Right Hi. Um, I saw you at Piers Morgan recently, and you um, you seemed confused about how, how it was that they caught Oswald so quickly. Um, this is information that's been on the public record a really long time and has been easily accessible. So I'm wondering why were you so confused on this issue? Because all they knew it that who, who, who said Oswald did it at that point in time? Well, there's a book downstairs I could walk you to that explains it in very clear detail. Really? Yeah, William Manchester's book. Really? Well, to me, it's this. I haven't read that book, but Kennedy was killed a long miles away from that theater. Tippett was killed about a mile from it. And the only thing, the guy, the, the merchant that saw Oswald, all he saw was Oswald sneak in the side. It was one of them old theaters I've been to it where they got the ticket thing out front. All he saw was Oswald go into the side, this merchant, and he called up and said, somebody just went into the Texas theater and didn't buy a ticket. Well, someone now, uh, wait also, a minute, wait a minute. Also called in a police officer on Tippett's uh, CB radio. Do what? Someone, someone used uh, Tippett's CB radio to let the authorities know what was happening. Well, we cover all that. No, they couldn't identify Oswald as doing it. You want to debunk that? They also found cartridge shell casings next to Tippett's body. Yeah, Oswald but they saw him run into the theater, uh, and they found him there. Oswald was carrying a revolver. And it didn't eject shells. So you're telling me he shot Tippett and empty the shells there? And they also had eyewitnesses see, see him run out of the depository. So they had a they had an, a, a description of him. So it How sort of nobody me put that a gun in Oswald's hand this. in that building. Nobody saw Oswald shoot. Or put, and they no, say, they saw, they saw wait a leave. minute, 
They say he carried the Manlich and Carcano in that day. He had curtain rods. Remember that bullshit? <laughs> Broke it down and had curtain rods, right? Well, I've seen the, I've shot the Manlich or Carcano. It has a long extended wood stock to where the barrel only sticks out about that far from the wood. If you break it down, I'm six foot four. I can't get that under my armpit and carry it because it's far too right, but too these long. are un unrelated details to the actually seeing Oswald leave the depository. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a Warren Commission guy. Yeah. No, I sure just read uh, William Manchester's Whoa. book. You know, well, who's Manchester? He's an esteemed historian who uh, wrote the book because and Jacqueline he, Kennedy commissioned him to do it. Really? Yes. Well, then why, did, we should Jacqueline, know this if you're why did Jacqueline Kennedy, the only quote she ever said was, they murdered my husband. She didn't say he did. What she context? said, they murdered my husband. What context they, did she say that? Huh? They. So she said something under duress. I'm not sure what that proves. Anyway, you and I don't choose to differ. You know, uh, and when they went to arrest Oswald, this guy that didn't buy a ticket to get into the theater, it's amazing. 10 squad cars, 24 cops, and the news media for a guy that didn't buy a ticket to go in the theater. You know, and that's all that. Now, you're going to tell me the merchant was there and he well, heard the police radio and he heard all that stuff. Well, the president so he just called got assassinated. The and so said, the entire hey, city was I got edge. your guy right here. He just snuck in. And let's, let's look at common sense here for a minute. You've just killed the president. So you run down, hide your gun, you run down six flights of stairs, and you go over and buy a Coke. That's got to be the greatest ad for Coca-Cola in history. <laughs> what do you do when you've just shot the president, the governor, you have a Coke and a smile? <laughs> that's, that's, that's believable behavior. Then, then, instead of laying low, getting out of co town, you've just shot the president. Common sense here. Let's put some common sense in. Nah, I think I'll go to the matinee at the theater. <laughs> There's a movie I haven't seen, and I think I'd like to go see it. <laughs> Apply some common sense, young man. It don't add up. It don't add up. You've just shot and murdered the president, so you go to the movies. <laughs> hey, that'd be my first shot. You know, that'd be what I'd do. You know, I'd go, I'd go to the movies. You know. And then amazingly, witnesses said he moved from person to person in there. Well, obviously, he was looking for his handler or whoever was handling him because Lee Oswald was a low level government agent. And you take a bus and a taxi on top of that. What's that? And you take a bus and a taxi on top of that. Yeah, whatever. But, uh, you know, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Governor. Big fan. Uh, my wife and I were supposed to travel next week to Florida, and we we're just wondering your thoughts on the odds of a false flag under this uh, so called Barry Satoro within the next what week. What now? like a false flag attack or anything leading to martial law within the next week. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. You know, I, was, I was just a governor of the state of Minnesota. I can't tell you what the feds are I was are just doing. asking your thoughts. You know. Yes, sir, way in the back. Uh, how do you plan to get into the base, number one? How do you plan to the to Well, uh, I don't plan anything. I haven't said I'm running. And to get into the d debates would require, I need your help. And I need it continually. We need a, the voices to come out and demand that I be put in the debates because they're not going to put me in there voluntarily. Absolutely not. Ross Perot got 20% of the vote in 92 and wasn't allowed, to, one out of five, and wasn't allowed to debate in 96 because Clinton and Dole cut a deal. Uh, Dole didn't want Perot in the debates because he felt it would eradicate his conservative base. Clinton didn't want debates at all because he was so far ahead, debates could only bring him down. So the two of them cut, made a deal that they'd eliminate Perot, and then Dole made the deal with Clinton that he would cut the presidential. That was the only time presidential debates were cut from three to two with the VP debate. And by design, the debates in 96, both of them were held on the same night as the World Series. Now, what should you watch? The debates. What you're going to watch? The World Series. And that was all by design. You know, that was all by design. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, yes, uh, Governor Kurtz, thank you for your service to our country. I appreciate that. Also, um, you've made the point about 
exposing things that we need to look at using common sense. In your opinion, why is it so hard for the masses to see this? The masses do see it. 80% of America does not believe the Warren Report, and then 20% uh, feel the Warren Report is accurate. So you've got about the right. How many people here? Raise your hand in here. How many people do not believe the Warren Report? How many, hands down, how many people do believe it? Sorry. <laughs> I'm good. Sure. I'm good. Okay. I have nothing to prove. Okay. Do you believe, I'll ask you, do you believe the Warren Report? Oh yeah, but okay. it's, not just the Warren, it's not just the Warren Report that concluded it. It's, Raise your hand it's a fallacy you to say it. it's just the Warren Report that concludes that Oswald did it. Well, the Warren Report says Oswald did it, and he had yep. no... Yeah, and so did several, so have several other researchers, so... Yeah, you believe that. So you, you're, but you're putting it all in the Warren Report. Well, that's the government's official document. If you go ask yeah, but, them, that's what they'll but refer to. But it's just like 9-11. It's not just oh, the, no. go, the if government If you go to the government to ask them about 9-11, they will refer you to the 9-11 Commission Report. Well, I could refer you to the Living Tower that writes its extensive of, of history of Islamism. Add, and, uh, of which I might add... The 9-11 report doesn't even include Building 7, this third building that went down in the afternoon. And let me tell you, when we were doing our show, very interesting, there was a BBC reporter, a BBC reporter, who gave a live broadcast to Britain stating how this third building had fallen, not hit by a plane or anything, and was down, right? The interesting thing about it was, on the tape, it's 4.50 in the afternoon, and the building is still standing right behind her. It hasn't fallen yet because it didn't go down till 5.20. So this report was sent back to Britain 30 minutes ahead of time before Building 7 went down. I'd like to know who knew it was coming down. Who knew that Building 7, a half hour early, was coming down and told this British reporter? And of course, we got no cooperation from the BBC. They wouldn't let us talk to the reporter. Now, if all this stuff is true, why do they restrict and not allow people to ask questions and talk about it? They don't do that. They don't let you do that. Yes, sir. Governor, you have a chapter in your book entitled The Complicity of LBJ. Um, George H.W. Bush was in the uh, CIA in Dallas. Uh, Richard Nixon, although he forgot where he was, where Kennedy George was Bush forgot where he was, too. Uh, and and um, Richard Nixon forgot where he was, and uh, Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. Was it just a coincidence that all these men um, became the President of the United States? I don't know. That I have to leave to you. I don't have the answer to that. Seems like a pretty decent coincidence, right? They all end up president, they all, you know, it's like LBJ, uh, the car is a crime scene, right? The murder took place in the car. Now we all watch TV and you know that in comes the yellow tape, they tape around it and the forensic has to go through and all that. That car Monday morning was already up at the Ford plant in Detroit being refurbished. That's obstruction of justice right there. Now why would they do that? Any dope knows that the crime scene has to be looked at by forensic before anything's released. Yet it was already up in Detroit, Michigan being refurbished at that time. You see, the, the fun thing about Kennedy is any of these people that believe the Warren Report and argue with you, you can tear them apart. Because there's so much evidence. Like I said, we got 63 things here. And when, you, when someone goes up for murder, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's 63 reasonable doubts. Let's say three of them aren't true. Well, that means you still got to deal with 60 more. 60 more. It's pretty overwhelming to me, you know. That, uh, that, uh, and, and not only that, but if you've ever been to Dealey Plaza, okay. <laughs> and if you've ever shot a gun, your first shot's going to be the best. That's the one you exhale on. That's the one that's going to be the best shot. Here, the first shot's off in the Never Never Land, and the third shot's the best. And the audio, the audio when that police officer left his radio on, and we cover that, the audio that you hear, two shots came right on top of each other. Bam, bam. 
which you could not possibly have worked that bolt on the Manlicher Carcano in that length of time and got off two shots that quickly because it takes, you have to recycle that bullet out and get a new one in there. And uh, it can't be done. I tried to do it, couldn't do it. Carlos Hathcock couldn't do it. The greatest Marine Corps sniper, but Lee Harvey Oswald, the radar man, could. <laughs> you know, he, could he could outshoot a Navy SEAL and the Marine Corps' greatest sniper. Wow. What's that? Those two sounds. Wasn't it a motorcycle backfire? No, no. And 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 not only that, but there, no. There was probably I would say at least probably six bullets fired that day. Because Kennedy, when he comes out in the Zabruder film, is already clutching his throat. You'll see it when he gets the thud. And oh, let's talk about this for a moment. All the doctors at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Many of them combat veteran doctors. It's a trauma center. They know the difference between an entry wound and an exit wound. Every one of them, you'll read in the book, including nurses, said it was an entrance wound in the throat that they performed a trait because they were trying desperately to save the president's life. They all testified it was an entrance wound. Yet Gerald Ford even admitted he moved the wound in the back and raised it up so it would work. Now, is that an investigation when you manipulate the facts to a preconceived conclusion? No. You're supposed to let the facts take you to a conclusion. And, and they don't do that. So, uh, final couple questions and then we'll sign some books. Yes, sir. Governor, not to divulge a little bit, but you have mentioned in previous interviews on TV about water movies. Can yes. you describe that to us again, and especially with your reference to Dick Cheney? Waterboarding, I'll just say this, it's torture, people. I was waterboarding what they call SEER school in my training, Survival, Escape, Resistance, and Invasion School. At that time, it was required for anyone that was going in the combat zone uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm a former competitive swimmer. I know what it's like to be in the water. It is torture. And uh, what he's referring to is I was on Larry King. Uh, talking about it, and Yale University apparently has every year the top ten quotes of the year, and I made it with what I said, and here's what I said. I said, if you give me Dick Cheney a waterboard in one hour, I'll have him confess to the Sharon Tate murders. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because waterboarding is torture. It's not some walk in the park or splashing water on somebody's face. It gives you, first thing it does, they put you on a slight decline. How many people have been in the water and got water in your sinuses where it burns? Well, the first thing it does, it fills up every sinus cavity in your body. Imagine the pain of that for a moment. Then it gives you the complete feeling that you are drowning. And like this Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that they claim confessed to 9-11, Gee, they waterboarded him, what, 157 times? I got news, everybody in this room would have confessed if they waterboard you 150 some times. No one could survive that, nobody. Yes, sir. Who would you believe is behind 9-11? I mean, people say the Saudi government is, but they have the best know. boy in the White House. I don't know. I believe it was a false flag operation to get us in the wars. <laughs> Because if you look at Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, now McNamara admitted that didn't happen. And that put us in Vietnam where 58,000 of my generation were killed and probably a million Vietnamese. The Rookstag fire in Germany, another false flag operation where the Germans, the Nazis burned down the congressional building and blamed it on the communists to, so the German people would rise up and support, it, support a, uh, a, an invasion of, of Russia. Uh, majority of wars are all started by false flag operations. Then there's the famous Operation Northwoods that Kennedy wouldn't do. The Joint Chiefs and, and, and the Pentagon want Operation Northwoods. This, resurf this surfaced when Oliver Stone did his film because it came out with the documents that were released. The Pentagon had, had plans to, make, to attack the United States and make it look like Cuba did it so that the people here would demand an invasion of Cuba. And I remember they, 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 they also said to Jack Kennedy, and we cover this in the book, they were pushing for a first strike against the Soviet Union with nukes. And the attitude was, well, if there's two Americans left and only one of them, we win. No, I think everyone loses if that happens. You know, and 
Put your, and Kennedy walked out of that out of that meeting, and he turned to somebody and he said this. He goes, "And we call ourselves the human race," and that's a quote. You know, Jack Kennedy stood for peace, and isn't it ironic? Everyone that stands for peace ends up dying at the end of a bullet. Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, when 68 was going to get us out of Vietnam, <coughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X when he came back from Mecca, he was a changed person, was standing for peace, and the one that hurts me even more than all of them, John Lennon. Yeah. John Lennon. Every person, I mean, Lennon's legacy will live forever. Because as long as there are people going and talking about peace and gather together, his song will be the song sung, Give Peace a Chance. So John left us a great peace message to use for the rest of our lives in avoiding these wars. Let's give peace a chance. Final question, the elderly guy back there. Uh, that must be you. I apologize for saying that. Okay. okay. Well, organized crime was involved. Kennedy made a ton of enemies, and organized crime was involved because at that time, and it's all come to light, that uh, the CIA was working with the mafia in an attempt to assassinate Castro because organized crime lost their playground. They lost all their hotels and casinos when Castro came into power. He booted them, so they didn't like Fidel, and, and they were working hand in hand, and then, of course, we had all these murders that happened right before they were supposed to testify in front of the select committee. Sam Giancana, George de Morinshield, all these people that had valuable information suddenly died the night before. I guess that's just circumstance. I guess that's just how it happened. Uh, well, I don't buy that. They were killed so that they couldn't talk. Uh, final question. Who wants the final question? Right there. You. Uh, okay. Uh, any connection, do you think, between Bilderberg, Rothschild, and the big international people? I don't know. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed, personally. How come when I won governor, I wasn't invited to the Bilderberg? <laughs> <laughs> Had I gone, I could probably sit here and tell you all about it. That's probably why I wasn't invited, because I would have come out and told people about it. What, what goes on at this big meeting, you know, of the Bilderberg? So, you know, again, I feel a little offended. I mean, do you think if I become president, I'll get invited? No, 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 no. I'm not sure. Last question, right there. Hi, how come uh, they tried over 600 times to assassinate Castro, and they couldn't get him on a small island? He was To assassinate Castro? Yes. Because Castro's a pretty bright guy. And you forget Castro led, you know, when I met Castro, I don't know if you know this, but I'm the only elected official who, while elected, met with Fidel Castro and got an hour with him. And when I met Castro, he shook my hand, and here's what he said to me. He said, you're a man of great courage. And I said back to him, sir, how can you say that? You don't know me. He said, because you defied your president to come here. He knew everything, because George Bush didn't want me to go. And by the way, do you know what they did when I went to Cuba? They suspended my wife's passport so she couldn't go with. Home of the brave, land of the free. You want to know why did they suspend my wife's passport? Why do you think? Shopping. Exactly. When women go with men on business trips, 90% of the time, what do they do? They go shopping. They didn't want her to spend one lousy dollar in Cuba, even though Cuba uses our currency. They don't have their own money, they use ours. And they didn't want my wife, I guess, going down there and maybe buying something, but you can't buy nothing anyway. Because it's pure communism money. down there. Everything's done through, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, well, they, they, everything's water, done water, through. Water, 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 water. Yeah, whatever. Well, they give you, the government gives you things, and you can go get your food, you can go get your clothes, and you can go get all your stuff. There are no there are no stores in Cuba. There aren't 7-Elevens where you can walk in and get a Pepsi or anything like that. It's, uh, it's very much pure communism down there. And I always wondered, and I'll end with this, I always wondered why China's communist. How come we have no problem going to China and those places and yet we can't go to Cuba, which is so close? And then it hit me one day. Uh, now I know why. 
because China welcomes corporations from here. Cuba threw them out. So that ought to show you right there that it's corporations that run our country today, not the president. It's corporations that run this country. Because why else could it be that you can't go to Cuba, but you can go to communist China? They're both communist. And it's because they kicked out our corporations in Cuba, and China's welcome to them. So that, that's, the, that's the reason. Final question for sure, young lady. And I'll say this, I know how to talk. Young lady. What is your and way? isn't it the corporations then that run the president and all of the government? Oh yeah, because uh, where do they get all their dirty money from? I mean, Barack Obama's biggest contributor was Goldman Sachs. They gave him the most money. And when you look at all of them, who do you think pays them off? And then of course now we got a Supreme Court that says corporations have the same rights as you. Well if that's the case, then why aren't corporations taxed the same way we are? How come they get a different taxation system if they're equal to us? They should have to pay the same taxes we pay then, if a corporation is you and I. You know, that was, I'll tell you that, the day the Supreme Court made that decision was a sad day for the United States of America. And I don't know how we get around that one, but I know how we can do it. There's a movement out there to amend the Constitution. It's the only way you can overrule the Supreme Court. The people must amend the Constitution. And I, and I know that there's a movement out there to amend our Constitution to state specifically corporations do not have the same rights as people do. And uh, that should be supported because how dare them say a corporation has the same rights. And I'll give you the quick example. How many heard the story of this, this young man that plays football for the NFL uh, in Philadelphia that made the racial slur? Well, what did the NFL do? They sent him to sensitivity training, right? And yet the story right after that was RG3 playing for the Washington Redskins. There is no more racist name that I've ever heard. Do you think you could walk up to a Native American in this country not knowing him and say, hey, Redskin, come here? Of course not. And so here's what I've determined. We as individuals will get chastised for a racial slur. Corporations won't because a corporation can have... I did NFL football for three years. Two years with Tampa and one with Minnesota on the radio back in the 90s. And I may have slipped up. I can't guarantee it, but I tried my damnedest. I would only refer to Washington as Washington. I would never say because I find that name offensive. Do you think you could have a team like in San Francisco and call them the, the San Francisco Yellow Skins and depict them as Chinese? Do you think you could have a team, the, the what do you call it, Black Skins, and you know, depict the African Americans like that? Absolutely not. It's high time Washington changed that nickname. And you know the only reason it's acceptable? Money. No. John Wayne said it in the movie. So therefore, hey, it's fine if John Wayne said it, by God, can't be nothing bad with the only good red skins, a dead one, or whatever they said in those old movies of, you know, of the, of the wars against the, the, the indigenous people here. But I mean, that's such an offensive name, I can't believe it, and how the National Football League. By the way, you know what else I heard? I heard way back in 61, the NFL got it put right in our tax code that they're a nonprofit. That's a good one, isn't it? And who would dare take on the NFL after all? Aren't they mom apple pie and the girl back home? You know? Well, one thing for sure, it's a good thing I wasn't governor of Minnesota because the Vikings wouldn't be getting a new stadium if I was there. You know? Uh -uh. Let them build their own stadiums. There's ways to do it. It's called seat licensing. The same as a golf course. You own your seats, you pay so much for them, 10, 15,000, then like true capitalism, you can sell them as you need to. Every game would then be sold out. You wouldn't have any blackouts. Everyone could watch. And when they say, well, the little people couldn't get in and watch the game. Little people can't afford to get in and watch the game anyway. 
you know, they're going to watch it on TV. Anyway, we'll sign some books. Thank you very much.